All right, 2020. Anybody want to do it again? No. <laughs> um, you remember all the 2020 vision prophecies? I think they've come true in this way. I think everyone in this room and everyone listening to me and everyone who's experienced this stuff is seeing things they didn't see before about ourselves, about our country, about our culture. Lord, give us eyes to see the kingdom. All right, you called for the offering already, and I think you showed the text to give, right? I'm, I, I'll get lost these days. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, would you open our eyes that we could see? And everyone said, all right, I'm gonna do a lot of scripture this morning. I'm gonna be out of step, sort of, sort of, with Advent and whatever. I was doing a history thing. I'm coming back to it next week. Um, you don't get more history than the, than the history of the birth of Christ. We've just come through the Jewish celebration of Hanukkah, the Festival of Lights, which celebrates the history of the rededication of the second temple after it had been defiled and the Maccabean family rose up and threw the Seleucid kingdom out and uh, they rededicated the temple. There was enough oil for the lamps for one day and it is said that lamps burned for eight days. We will see an eighth day picture this morning as we go through our scripture Steve talked to you about John the Baptist and Jesus last week a bit as he digressed into Matthew 11. I have to confess, when he told me he was gonna preach Matthew 11, I, I had some pause about it because I'm like, I've been, I'd preached on that in the last few years a bunch of times, although time gets protracted in my mind. And as I realize, it's probably been a couple of years. But... Um, I thought, well, I'm pretty sure I've milked that for everything it's worth. And then he got up and spoke and I said, I guess not. <laughs> anyway, Steve did a wonderful, wonderful job. What a gift he is to this body and you will do well for your, yeah, go ahead. What a gift he is. And you, you will do very well to, to partner with him in the new year and go through the Bible and uh, let, let the Bible kingdomize your thinking after a year of politicizing our thinking pretty radically. Can we do that? The spirit of prophecy and the power of a story. A few short years ago, I was with my friend Ted Haggard and he said, evidence is helpful when you're trying to make a point but nothing sways a mind like a story. And one of the things that's been true of 2020 is we now know that evidence does not sway people. Stories sway people. Uh, I can illustrate it on the left and the right. Shall I? I didn't really do this last night, but whatever. Um, if there's one thing that I thought in my life everybody would agree on, everybody would agree on, was the unjust death of George Floyd. And I've never seen a thing that I thought more people agreed on uh, ever that divided more people. Because it became, instead of becoming a historical event, it became a story about America and race. And what you found out, what we did find out in 2020 is that no amount of factual evidence will sway anyone 
from a story that they have believed in, especially if that story has reached inside and got the place of your pain. You say, well, how are you going to prove it on the other side? Election fraud. Everybody wants to tell me about election fraud tells me about a story of something that they heard or saw or read and it happened somewhere. And so I'm like, great, that's great. Let's go to court and get that fixed. We go to court, it doesn't get fixed and those who had the story remain unpersuaded. Tell me a story. Now, why I start with this because stories anchor our soul. Our desire, our, my, my thing is this, truth, truth, tell me the truth. Give me people who love the truth. Give me people that love the truth so much they want to be proven wrong when they're wrong. Give me people who love the truth so much that they will, that they will lay their lives down for the truth even when the truth goes against them. Surely, at some point in 2020, you've been faced with a truth that you thought was a lie or a lie that you thought was truth. If it hasn't, then your eyes haven't been opened yet to 2020. So here I sit at this point waiting for the new year and all I have in my heart right now is the truth. Oh God, the truth. And so the spirit of prophecy and the power of the story is what I'm gonna tell you. We're gonna go into John, the precursor, John Baptist, the precursor to the Matthew 11 story, the story of the prophecy of his birth. Here it is. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. By the way, I highlight that verse because theologically, I have my, my background is Calvinist. And to say this about someone is against my Calvinist background. In other words, I'm saying, here's a little piece of evidence in the word that goes against my deeply held assumptions that we're that we're. You know, like, wait a minute, tell us about their sin. No, this text actually says that they were righteous before the law. And we go, I don't know where to put that. You need that. You need stuff you don't know where to put. Others of you are sitting there going, well, I can explain that to you, Pastor, if you'll give me five minutes. I won't. Then they had no child, but, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. The reason uh, that verse six is there is so that you'll understand verse seven better. Because the assumption about them would be that, well, man, they're amazing people. However, they don't have a child. They must have done something. That stuff did lie in the weeds. And Luke is telling us this on purpose because God is gonna get in the mix. I, I, I'm, I'm from a Baptist, actually I'm from a Lutheran root and a Baptist branch, but um, I'm, I'm charismatic in fruit. But I got some friends that are vineyard, lots of friends that are vineyard. And vineyard, the definition in the vineyard of having gone to church is God showed up. Did God show up? They mean, did anything happen extraordinary? Now listen, there's not very many of us here. Oh, but God is waiting to break in on somebody. And maybe they're there through that camera lens and into that internet theme. Either way, Lord, don't let us go to church without you. We've done it before. And sometimes we've, never mind, hallelujah. Now, while he was serving as a priest before God, when his division was on duty, and you can read about this in the law, and they, 
Priests were broken into divisions and they would come and serve in the temple as was their, according to the custom of the priesthood. And he was chosen by lot to enter the temple and burn incense. Ah, the lights and the fire and the prayers. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of the incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, and all, all the way through the Bible, this is the word. God shows up and he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. And you will call his name John. Beloved. Hallelujah. Okay, so the spirit of prophecy means God spoke to you and you heard. That's what it means. In this case, it's mediated by an angel. And you will have joy and gladness. Hallelujah. Anybody need some joy? I don't think 2020, I don't think for most of us, you're going to say, what a joyous year. <laughs> I'm certainly not going to describe that as first on the list. But listen, but listen, but listen. He's met with you this year and the joy of it. You will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink. Let him be under a Nazarite vow from birth. And he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Now, it's against the theological rules for anybody to be called righteous before the law. And it's against the theological rules for anybody to be filled with the Holy Spirit uh, inside their mother's womb. But God, he can do whatever he wants. He hardly ever asks for my permission. But God, who, need, who needs a but God that, that'll blow past your objections? Who needs a but God that'll, that'll contradict your assumptions? I do. By the way, I don't think they were, would have considered these contradictions, but he will not drink wine or strong drink. He'll be filled with Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. Now, you need to understand that it was deeply embedded in Israel by this time, that, that prophecy had largely gone silent. And here is the spirit of prophecy showing up. And here we're here. And listen, being filled with the spirit was synonymous with the spirit of prophecy. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord's people, for the Lord of people prepared. Hallelujah. Everybody is really desirous that the misery of 2020 will yield in the majesty of an outpouring of Holy Spirit. Everybody wants that. This is the one place where, and I got, I got plenty of things right now. I'm gonna be honest with you. I got plenty of things with plenty of people that I love with all my heart that I just think they're mistaken. But I'm with, but I'm with them with one heart on, oh, that the outcome would be a fresh outpouring of Holy Spirit. 
What do you want? Your presidential candidate to win or the Holy Spirit to pour out a revival? You just said both, didn't you? Come off of that. Come off of that. What an outpouring of Holy Spirit. Usually an outpouring of the Holy Spirit follows poverty of spirit, dryness, absence, silence, plague. As I've been telling you about the early part of this nation, uh, what, six outbreaks of, of smallpox in the years prior uh, to 1721? In the years prior to the Great Awakening, and then another outpour, another outbreak of of uh, smallpox, and the discrediting of the church. Literally, one of the most disruptive times of discrediting the church in the history of this nation was under the ministry of Cotton Mather that I've told you about when he introduced variolations as a kind of a as, a, as a precursor to vaccinations. And by the way, yes, from that day to this, that process has always had ups and downs and controversy. It's a mess. But 10 years after, 10 years after Cotton Mather died, the outbreak of the Holy Spirit came. And the Great Awakening happened, which I'm going to tell you about again very soon. But there's never been a time, there's never been a time on this earth like when the day spring from on high visited. Hallelujah. Well, John was being prophesied. I always think, you, you need to always think, the Bible is for short, is, is very, is, the Bible is a, a, is a shortening. It's a, it's, I, I don't think this happened as quickly as we can read it. Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in, in years. Logical contradiction. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Oh, okay, so here we go. We, you and I live in the age of identity politics. I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. That's my identity. The visitor says, that's cool. I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Listen, do you know how many times the, you know how many times the priest had gone in there? and burned the incense, and the people had prayed. Do you know how often the ritual, the routine, the normal? But you and I are people of Holy Spirit, and we live for the breakthrough. We live for the moment when King of Kings and Lord of Lords says, enough, here we go. Tell me, you're hungry for it, you're hungry. For a word, a word, a clear word from God that will contradict your old age and barrenness. Here it came. Here it came. I'm Gabriel, standing in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you'll be silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their time. Oh Lord, how I need that miracle. How many of you like, would like for God to strike you silent lest you contradict his word? <laughs> Listen, I'm not, I'll, I'll be honest with you right now. I wish God would strike the whole lot of us silent. I'm waiting for a prophet to get up and say, I can't speak. and not have that as an introduction to they're gonna speak anyway. (laughs) 
I mean, this is incredible. He gets this word and silence. And the people were waiting for Zechariah and they were wondering at the delay in the temple. This is why I think, I don't think this happened in the time you could read it. They're like, what's he doing in there? By now they're whispering. They're checking with each other. Should somebody go check? What do we do? Where's Zechariah? That's the day God came to church. All right. That's, that's the introduction to the matter. But no, one more. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when the time of, his ser- of service was ended, he went home. And after these days, his wife, Elizabeth, conceived And for five months, she kept herself hidden saying, thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach from among the people. It's very common, by the way, for women who have been barren when they conceive to keep the secret longer than most pregnant women do. But this was like five months of seclusion and there's no reason to Zechariah go out there. He can't talk. They had, a, they had a sheltering in place. You can find anything in the Bible if you look. <laughs> By the way, self-imposed, that's the right kind. All right, so here we've been. Here we've been. Not strangely, nine months into our sheltering in place. Remember this? I brought this to you twice. I brought it to you early and then after the, after the, uh, the matter of uh, the first gubernatorial orders and then I brought it to you again after the death of George Floyd. I said, these are my concerns. These are my pastoral concerns. I said, first of all, it's the tendency for us to posit meta-narratives, stories to explain everything. Is there anything anybody wants more than a story? To, like, we want, to, we want to read somewhere where it'll make sense. We, we want to know that the deep state did this, the Chinese did this, the Russians did this, the vaccination people did this, Somebody did this, and we somehow we have this strange idea. We like we we actually strangely like the idea that somebody's really smart enough to pull all this off. I just think there's a lot of vultures out there that wait for stuff to happen so they can go eat. Just saying. I feel better about that than the idea that there's somebody that smart out there. We can pull all these things off at once cause all these things to happen. So I said, I'm concerned about that. It's happened. The tendency to politicize everything. I don't know if you remember this, but when when they first told us to shelter in place, they told us that the vaccine was no, I'm sorry, that the disease was no respecter of persons and everybody was vulnerable. That's what they told us. Within weeks, they were telling us that this, this vaccine is just like everything else. It's racist and only hits, and, and hits certain people and it's all our fault because of, of the racism of the vaccine. I mean, of the disease. It's true. I'm not kidding. This is really what we've done. We've politicized everything. And now I'm here. They're politicizing the rollout of the, who gets vaccinated. And, and they're gonna tell a story. If you, if you, if you, if you withhold it from the... The, uh, if, you, if you give it to old people, there's now a, a, a word out that says, old people in the country are mostly white. That would be racism. If you, if you give it to people based on their marginalization status, they'll say, you're experimenting on the minorities. This is the world we're living in. This is happening every day. <laughs> How do you know? Well, because I live in the information age. By the way, I stopped, y'all know I stopped social media, but I still consume every piece of information I can find everywhere. 
And if I can't get some, then I walk into Steve's office and say, tell me what I'm missing. And he tells me, he knows more, he, he got more than I do. I'm, I'm like, oh yeah, he's, he's, the, he's the guy that walks around and I go, I go, Steve, and he goes, yeah, I already read that and thought about that and digested that. And here's the truth about that. And I walk out and say, I thank you, God, for him. <laughs> and then call him smarty pants. The tendency to polarize over extraneous things. And I talk about manners. You've been, look, come on. We've, everybody in here has been mad at somebody about something. Mask, no masks. Eating in, eating out. Showing up at church, only being online. Everybody here has been mad about everything. It has happened. I guess this proves I'm a prophet. No, it just proves the human race is very predictable. The tendency to panic over being unsafe. That's a kind of the, a newer one. And so I, I will tell you, this is again another thing. It doesn't matter what kind of evidence there is. Somebody's gonna tell you, the daily panic porn. So we say, vaccine is safe. No, 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 people are having anaphylactic shock. So we're saying, disease only affects the old. No, 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 uh, ki kids are dying. Uh, you go point oh oh whatever percent of kids are dying. Yes. So we know every bad thing and we panic over everything. So, so this stuff has happened, right? This stuff has happened. It's pastoral concerns. Now I'm gonna tell you, put on love, which covers a multitude of sins. Forgive, forgive the conspiracy spreader and the political polarizer and the, and the bad, bad manners person and your pastors invading your fragility. We gotta, we gotta be gospel people in the midst of this. The gospel is bigger than all this stuff. The gospel is greater than all this stuff. And nobody ever manages to figure out exactly what the, what, the, what the right party to stand with is at all times. I keep saying this stuff. I want us to be kingdom people, really riveted to Jesus, really riveted to him. I want us to be kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. I wanna be that. And then I slip into conspiracies and polarization and politicization and fragility. Yes, I do it myself. You've seen me. Hallelujah. Pastoral concerns have panned out well. We go from verse 26, I think it was, to verse 57. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her and they rejoiced. There's that joy again. By the way, birth of a child, always joy. Birth of a child, always joy. Not surprising to me that, that the assault on the birth of children has been the major crime of the Western world. The assault on birth. Oh God, give us a heart once again to love the birth of a child and that no child would be unwanted. Oh God, give us the day again when our hearts leap for joy at the news of pregnancy. Oh God, give us the day when women will be honored, treasured, protected. Can it be? Can it be? Can a kingdom, can a kingdom outcome in this world happen in our sexuality, Lord? Can it happen? Can it happen? The great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day, there that is, they came to circumcise the child. So the eighth day was, listen, it's prophecy day. That's what I'm just telling you now. It was prophecy day. So, so catch this. The eighth day of John's birth, the spirit of prophecy breaks out. At this point, it's no longer merely in the angelic ambassadors. It's going to come out in a person. 
You say, what are, what are you making a big deal of? Oh, eighth day, new beginnings. Eighth day, so prominent in the Bible. Such a signpost. The eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him Zechariah after his father. They, they, they. There's always the, there's always the they out there. And the mother said, no, he should be called John. Wait, you've been waiting all these years for a child? You finally have one? And you're not gonna go, dad's name. They said, none of your relatives are called by this name. Like it was a social offense. I wish I fully understood the context of that. And they made more signs to his father inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he was asking for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And th this is the second time they all wondered. First time they wondered, he was in there taking too long. Second time they wonder, he's naming his child. By the way, I'll say it again. I've said this a lot of times. Opportunity for me to tell you. Fathers, your job is to tell your children who they are. That means... That means more than the fact that you get the right, if you will, to, to give them their name. Nope, you tell them who they are. That's what he's about to do. Mom and dad uh, are in agreement on this, but dad's about to bust out. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed and he spoke blessing God and fear came on all their neighbors and these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts saying, when will this, what then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. <laughs> what then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Giving you a lot of scripture today. It's the way I'm keeping myself out of the ditch on the week before Christmas. Because <laughs> I want you to know that my mind and my study has been in the ditch on the left and the ditch on the right and the ditch up high and the ditch down low. I want to set everybody straight. And boy, is that a vain pursuit. I got some good news for you this morning. God's at work in the world. I got some good news for, this, for you this morning. You aren't in charge of it. You aren't the cause of it. You might be the avenue of it. He might use you. If he does, it's as likely to be by your silence as by your words. I want you to know God's at work in the world. God is at work. He's at work right now. God is at work in, in America. He's at work in the nations. God's at work in history. History is going somewhere. It's not a random set of events. God is at work. Man is not in charge, though we will continue to imagine that we're in charge and we will continue to imagine to be his counselor and we will continue to try to manipulate the events of history. We will continue to do what we do. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied. The spirit of prophecy is now Loose. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Here's what the deal is he's telling their story. I told you in the beginning, you want to change people's mind, you got to tell them a story. The story is the story of God at work in history. And they were constantly aware of who they were as people who were part of the family through whom God had said he would do his work. And they knew that in their midst was one family, the family of David, and that out of the family of David would come the horn of their salvation, one who like David would come. Oh, they were not looking for, <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> Don't go that way. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. From the time of David until the time of Jesus, the prophets had fixed in their mind, David was coming. And sometimes the prophets would say that God was going to come and bring a terrible judgment, but for 
David's sake. Because you remember that David had the word that, the, that he would have a son. He would, his son would rule forever. David is coming. And that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of those who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant and the oath that he swore to our father Abraham and to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Now listen, he's not prophesying something no one had ever heard so far. He's only prophesying what they'd already heard. Everything that he says in there is a, is a compression of their whole history of prophecy. And you want to be a prophet? Immerse yourself in Holy Scripture. I might believe what you tell me about the birds and the flowers if I can hear the hint of what you are saying in the anchor and the root of the words of the apostles and the prophets that have come before you. People say, what's the training for prophecy? Word of God, 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 word of God. And then... Some people who are anointed in the spirit to come along beside you and, and activate you. And, although sometimes it's just he shows up behind the curtain. <laughs> in the womb. Yes, indeed. Now, here's what I like about this. If you're, if you're a literal-minded Hebrew or Jew in the day of Zechariah, if you're, if you're that guy, you're, you're, you're there, you're hearing this word, and I want you to know something. You are immediately politicizing this word. And you say, they didn't do that. Well, they absolutely did do that. So that by the time Jesus came on the scene, they were so radically politicized, you wouldn't believe it. Unbelievably. And that political impulse rose in them and rose in them and rose in them right up to 68 AD in the Jewish wars when it got banished. And if you looked at that and you looked at that history of those uh, 70 years from the birth of Jesus and the, and the coming of John and the later the soon after the birth of Jesus, to the destruction of Jerusalem, 70 years. Thereabouts. And if you looked at the politics that happened in that time, and you look at this, you say, well, it didn't happen. And that's why I want you to know something. Politics and prophecy are troublesome bedfellows. I can give you a lot of text to show you because I'm in the word. Enough of that, lest you think I'm saying something. And you, child, will be called, you, child, will be called prophet of the Most High. You will go before the Lord to prepare his way and to give the knowledge of salvation to the people in the forgiveness of their sins. Ah, we finally come to the gospel. If, we was, if this was a Lutheran church, we'd probably just start there. Because listen, the gospel is this. It's the announcement. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins, which are many, have been forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are no longer in your sin. But from this day, you are in Christ. And anyone who hears and believes experiences that reality. And it's still our gospel. 
Our gospel is still the forgiveness of sins. And if revival comes, it'll come because people will come to the end of themselves and the end of self-definition and the end of self-identity and the end of self-assertion and the end of politicization. And they will desire the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to touch them and to heal them in a way they can't heal themselves. This is the forgiveness of sins promised in the sacrifices, promised in the days of atonement, promised in the Passovers, but enacted in Jesus, forgiveness of sins. We're coming to the table in just a moment. You start getting yourself ready because of the tender mercy of our God, thereby, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. And then if you want a little connection with Hanukkah, here it is to give light to those who sit in darkness. And oh, by the way, those who sit in darkness were the Gentile world. The day spring is coming. He's bringing forgiveness of sins to his own people and he's given light to those who sit in darkness and that would be you and I. And in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace, And the child grew and became strong in spirit and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Hallelujah. 2020. Here it is. Came upon us with such promise and hope came upon us with with even joy, but it has wrenched the life out of us and it has pushed us further from one another, both physically by mandate and emotionally by conflict and spiritually by contradiction. And here we are, people of Jesus, celebrating the birth of Jesus. Don't miss it in the politics. I'm the most political animal you know, more political than any of you. No, maybe not. But I'm in it. But I want you to know that on January 20th, my assignment will be the same as it is on December the 20th. Herald of the kingdom. Herald of the kingdom. Herald of the prince of peace. And if we are to be the heralds of Jesus, we shall have to speak to the mighty ones in this culture where they be left or right and say to them, you are not the king. There's one king. His name is Jesus. And you must bow before him with all of your wealth and all of your might and all of your armies and all of your self-will and all of your blustering. And if they begin to confess him, revival will come. My job is to proclaim it. I'll keep doing that. Hallelujah. If there's one thing I will rejoice in over COVID days, it is that we have come to the centrality of this moment. You want to meet Jesus, meet him in the bread and the cup. If you want to meet Jesus, meet him in the bread and the cup. For those who take the bread, receive him bodily as the one who bore our sins on the tree. We who receive the bread eat his flesh. We who call upon the Lord. This is for your healing, church. Blessed be the name of the Lord.
Hallelujah. I sometimes say I'm never more alive than when I'm proclaiming Jesus. But the Bible says to drink this cup is to proclaim him until he comes. So join me in life, the life of Jesus. Would you stand? Oh, how I love you. And how I thank God for you today. Your eyes have heartened my soul. Your attentiveness has encouraged me. Thank you, good Lord. But still, I don't know about you. I, I, I've got to be clear with you. I need him today. Few things are as clear to me as the fact that we are at a crossroads that will, that will change things profoundly in the coming years. Even as we looked at 9-11 as a day that changed everything, we're going to look at 2020 as the year that changed everything. It's, a, it's one of those years. You need a Zechariah moment. A messenger from heaven speaking to you.